Hi, I'm Jamie Mitchell, and welcome to another episode of the Late Drop Big Wave Podcast. Today we have none other than Santa Cruz Big Wave legend, Peter Mel. Uh, Peter is one of my best friends. Uh, he is a guy that I respect uh, a lot. And today we talk about everything. We talk about growing up in Santa Cruz in his dad's freeline surf shop. We talk about um, his first trip to Hawaii when he got the bug uh, for surfing big waves at Sunset Beach. Uh, we definitely get into Mavericks. Um, Mavericks has been a huge part of Pete's life. And we finish off with just uh, some wisdom of where he thinks big wave surfing is heading in the future. So I had a great time chatting with Pete. It's one of my favorite podcasts so far. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks. The Condor, my good buddy, Peter Mel. How are you, buddy? I'm good, Jamie. How are you? Good to see your face. Um, yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's been a while in these crazy times. Yeah, it has. I've been What's, locked uh, in retail. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, what's, uh, I mean, I, I, I sort of know what you've been doing, but what, what has been going on in the whole, this, this craziness that we call world right now? Um, I know Freeline has been a, the, the big you know, baby for you guys getting that. I know you remodeled that a long time ago and just got that all dialed in and then the world imploded yeah. on itself. So what's, how, how's that been going? <laughs> doing all right. As long as I'm surfing, it's doing okay. Um, recently, um, a lot of time in the store, which uh, is kind of necessary, I think, in these times. So that it's one of the things that I think has been kind of a blessing is that every kind of ma and pa business has gone back to ma and pa full on. So that's what's kind of happening. Um, hanging out with family. They're close by. I got my kids in town. I got my kids working in here. Um, I've got my dad occasionally popping in um, and they're, they're doing their thing. So it's, you know, it's, um, I guess as normal as you can make things in this time, but it's, it is difficult and challenging. The retail landscape is, uh, it's, it's unique in this time, really. It's, um, mm. there's a lot of busyness to it. There's, but there's people management and just the whole thing. It's, it's wild in the retail world and, uh, just managing, pivoting, managing, yeah. doing whatever I can. Keep a smile. Make it happen. <coughs> Whoa. Keep a smile on my face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that, that's a perfect segue into where I want to go. Cause you talk about mom and pop business, your dad, um, John Mel, like if you go back to where it all started for you, it seems like you had, you were that kid that had the dad that was a shaper, had the, had the surf shop all that stuff and that's probably where you sort of grew up right and got that whole sense of what surfing was the love for surfing would i be right in saying that yeah uh, well 100 percent. i don't think i had a choice <laughs> i mean i literally grew <laughs> that, up in a, yeah right i didn't have a choice it was it was ingrained in my father's blood and my mom's for that matter too i mean she helped run the store while i was running around in diapers so uh, my dad was surfing shaping working in the back mom running the front you know like full on that's exactly how it was in our home so i really didn't have a choice jimmy <laughs> i think i was yeah. going to be surfing i have my first surfboard here hanging up one that i remember um very clearly that's hanging in the store it's very dear and it's true full circle all the way back here doing yeah what my mom and dad are doing it's pretty crazy yeah i, I mean you're in the office right now at freeline it just it just is crazy for me to like you know obviously knowing you pretty well in the family and being at the shop and all that. And to see like it, like having the kids and Tara working there and making that happen. And that's how it all started for you. Like it's, it's incredible. You know what I mean? And um, sometimes, you know, sometimes weird things create, um, yeah, brings, brings it back, you know, brings the families back together and they've got to, everyone's got to, you know, put in their, you know, put in their energy and time to make things work. Sometimes it can be a good thing. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, especially in these uneasy times for everybody, you know, it's, uh, it's the yeah. whole globe is feeling this in a big way. Yeah. And so did your, was, was did your mom and dad, um, were they born in Northern Cal Santa Cruz as well? Or uh, how, did, how did they end up there till you get there? That's funny. Yeah. South Bay. I think, uh, there was a, basically Watch. a hotbed of surfing out of South Bay. I mean, a lot of people were coming out of that in that era. There was the crew, I mean, sixties, they everyone was coming to the North shore, right? That was that crew. Irons brothers are out of the South Bay, like, um, Coletta's, uh, they're all, it's funny how many people have come originated out of California, Southern California and migrated to Santa Cruz or even around the world for that matter, um, in that era. Cause that's kind of where it was starting pretty heavily besides Santa Cruz. Like South Bay was a surfing Mecca early, early years, right? In the fifties for body glove O'Neill, like we're all doing their thing at that time. So it was, a. Uh, 
again, it's just like this, I guess the community of surfing community, they were kind of tight knit. We sit around pretty good waves and uh, pretty good places to live. And then we spread from there to other places that are good. Uh, you know, it's all over yeah, the world. It's, it's, it seems weird because I mean, all the love to the South Bay. Cause I got a lot of, I got a lot of love in South Bay, but um, the waves sort of suck down there. <laughs> you, it's not you know that I mean? bad. They're hanging, well, you know, it's, it, it is a big giant bay. There's not much swell gets in there. I mean, you probably, they're probably heading further South and stuff. And, uh, but, um, but yeah, so they, so they end up migrating North and up at Santa Cruz. Um, and then you were born in Santa Cruz. <laughs> yeah, I <it> was. <laughs> they, they actually, it was funny how the North shore thing, you know, they, they, when again, trying to find the best ways where surfing Mecca was, I was, my dad was chasing the dream. Um, and he put some time in on the North shore and then, um, you know, to come then just go, you know what, this is probably not the spot. Let's go somewhere else. And then end up in Santa Cruz. Mm. I mean, it was really cool. Um, either way, I think it would have been cool for me to either brought up on the North shore or brought up in Santa Cruz. Uh, I think the same thing would have been happening. I would have been surfing. <laughs> yeah. You just would have liked warm water a little better. <laughs> <laughs> this is true i don't mind cold water here though you know yeah yeah i don't remember and so that. so then so when did when did was your dad sh like shaping before so and then he opened up freeline so what what year was freeline opened in santa cruz 69 was the year that it opened here just down the road right from where i'm at um you know a five minute walk uh so they moved over in 69 um, and literally just opened up a store randomly and it, it moved into our home, which was even further up the street here on 41st. But we've been on 41st pretty much the whole time since the 60s. Uh, you know, 69 was when it started. It was kind of when O'Neill was making a move. They were pretty, you know, starting in Santa Cruz. It was kind of starting a little industry here. Uh, there was Hotline. There was um, Santa Cruz surfboards. You know, there was a, an NHS. You know, you think about Novak. Um, that was a big part of the whole Santa Cruz vibe. So it was kind of one of those areas. It was just to start an industry, you know, skateboard and surf industry was happening right then. Was that, I remember you took me to where your dad was shaping out of, and then it had a fire, right? So was that the original place? Was that the same place or had you, had you moved? That was the same place. Well, when we first started, it, it was all under one roof, right? It was like, it was literally yeah. our manufacturing and everything was there. And then there was a factory over on Thompson Avenue, which was again, like most factories are, you get a bunch of surfboard guys that are working together. They take over an area, they glass, they're sharing the glassing mm. and the sanders and the shapers. That's kind of how it was here too. Um, and then he ended up getting his own factory on his own. Uh, that was that was later in the 70s, 80s, probably even. Um, so, I mean, we've just been in that, that surfboard fan manufacturing and retail since the very beginning so i mean i either i was in it or traveling the world or you know just trying to do yeah. everything around surfing i look back on you know I, as much as i was born into it it's given me everything really um yeah it's a pretty good life giving me sanctity right now yeah and then when so when <laughs> when did you start surfing then so did your dad were you like a super super grom like you know was it like it was he dragging you along like whenever you sort of could do it at three four five years old or was it a bit later? When did you actually start getting in the water? Um, my dad tried taking me at a very early age. I, you know, I don't know how many successful surfs we had early, but I do remember one that we didn't have that was great. It was <laughs> kind of one of the ones that um, it kind of scared me a little bit, just a, away from where we were at Sewer Peak. You know, it was like I got caught in the kelp, and it was a pretty radical little wipeout. I've told the story before, but like, it was one that just um, it kept me kind of whoa. I don't know if I like this, you know, and, and I ended up having to go down to Capitola, which is down the point from there and uh, spent time kind of going with my mom and boogie boarding and starting there. So it was later in life in the sense, but I could have been, you know, I could have started at six, you know, but I got kind of scared off till I was around 10. You know, I was doing soccer, baseball, doing kid stuff, which is cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then the surfing thing kind of really bit when I was around 11 or 12. Yeah, that's interesting because I'm I'm at that stage right now with with Nevaeh and Malia. It's yeah, like right. it's it's like uh they you know they want to go surfing and <laughs> you know their their local break is Sunset Point. <laughs> it's like yeah. you know and you, <laughs> that's you the know, one time that you and, yeah you know and, and like even though it's like you go out in the small point days and there's little reforms going in you know like it's still reef it's still sunset there's still energy you know so if they so for me it's it's been a really um interesting time of like how how hard to push and sometimes it's them wanting to push me to go 
further and oh, yeah. and me actually like pulling back as well because talking to parents you know i was talking to um sean briley the other day and there's all these other people and they you know we all tell stories about the kids you know they're like oh yeah i took him out and he didn't surf for five years six years he was so scared you know <laughs> so it's this this fine line of trying to like get them in the water without scaring them so much that they don't want to go in but touch wood for me that i've um i've done okay so they all end up they haven't and enjoying it for all the good reasons right yeah uh, take it on very early and some some don't i mean with john i kind of did the same thing i was like vowing i mean even with kids it feels like just at the beach and um that experience of waves and watching waves and being around that that's the start really that's where you're going to yeah. start to understand knowledge of what you need to do where the rips are you know and, and play in the water a little bit and get beat up a little bit and just those little steps are all part of it mm -hmm. and yeah that's why i always it's like yeah i know you don't have to take them straight out to the point and push them into the yeah. four foot wave but you know for the first time you just you know white water um getting beat yeah. up on the beach it's all big steps yeah yeah we've been we found the pool the pool has been a huge um blessing mm. for us just getting them in the pool without any sort of waves or rocks or anything it's been it's been giant but um so you, so well, you, you said that you started any laps now underwater <laughs> <laughs> underwater you know just like... yeah. <laughs> uh what are I gonna say i was gonna say um you said that you just did normal kid stuff you know like baseball or all the all the kids stuff and then you you know that sort of early teens is when you really is that when you really dove into you know did you start to like want to compete do the little contests, the, or the, you know, what are they, NSSAs around town? Is that yeah. sort of the age yeah. you got into that? I did. Um, it was more for us up here. It was the WSA. It was kind of pre-NSSA, right when NSSA was getting kicked in. Um, I ended up doing them when I was around 16 or 17, but uh, it was WSA District 2. Down, you know, Doc Scott ran the association. That was the very first competitions that we were doing. He was running it out of a bus. It was the most awesome time ever to have surf contest. It was at the lane, it was at Anyo. It was like all these different places all over the world, all over Santa Cruz, not the world, but Santa Cruz. Yeah. And he was like, it was Doc was the head of it all. Um, you know, legend Doc Scott still kicking today too. Like, I just, thanks for reminiscing of that. Um, yeah, so that was the era of, of competition back then, and it was a blast because it was really community driven. There was a lot of good surfers involved. Uh, you know, it was fun. Uh, you know, everyone was having a ball, um, and you know, low pressure, better times. That it feels like when you reflect on it. But um, yeah, you know, now it's just different. Just different now. Just I would say sim it seems like the word is simpler times, right? Things were yeah. just simple. It was you know. Yeah. If we yeah, could go back you know, to simpler times, I think everyone would be into that. <laughs> yeah, a little more relaxed, for sure. Yeah. So, and then um, I remember you telling me a story, and I, I actually googled it this morning, so I didn't butcher it. But um, it was at fourteen. You went to Hawaii. I'm not yeah. sure if it was your first trip. It may have been your first trip for the U.S. Uh, championships, and it was at Makaha, right? Yep. I think, and that then was really that was one of my first. Yeah, sorry. That I was going to say that was when you, from what I remember, is when you got the the, the hooks got dug in for big waves. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know you were over there for Makaha, but you went out to Sunset, and Sunset yeah. sort of dug the claws in, and you sure. got that got the feel for what it was. Yeah, it was a it was a good group of guys that I went over there with. Um, it was like Will Church, Mark Machado, Mark Gowen, um, all really good surfers from our area, and. Uh, obviously charged a bit. Mark Gowen was the one kind of leading the charge as far as wanting to surf bigger waves. Uh, he had bigger boards. I went over there with a 6'10 and a 6'5 and, you know, 5'10. That was like my, you know, my boards for the U.S. championships. Uh, it was three boards. I was killing it. Um, that's all you needed back then, though. That's the funny thing. Now you need 26 boards. No, uh, it was going there and we, it was, you know, when Sonny Garcia, John Shimoka, Ross Williams, Shane Dorian, like those are all them. They were all grommets back then. Kelly Slater was there. Like, um, no, actually he wasn't at that US Championships. Now you think about it. Or no, yeah, he was. He was there. He was a Manahuni. Um, but yeah, just the, the era of all the names that were part of that uh, that kind of moment. It was 84 is when it was. Uh, and I was uh, 12 years, 14 years old, I think. Yeah, 13 turning on 14. Turned 14 on the trip, I think. Anyway, uh, yeah, got had a, a session at Sunset Beach on borrowed 7-6 that um, I remember it was big water, you know, it was way bigger water than I'd even experienced in Santa Cruz at the time, you know, so, uh, and I got one to the channel, kicked out, probably it was just a full shoulder ride, but it was the best feeling ever. And that was the point where I went, huh, 
I kind of like this. And, you know, and then that mm. point next year as I was bringing bigger boards and surf YMA, like not, you know, maybe the year, a year, two years later for, you know, first kind of bigger day. And that was wild and had a good time there. And, um, and then Hawaii came something that I always wanted to go to. And, you know, as you know, as you have gravitated yourself to the North shore, it's one of the best places in the world to, to be a, a surfer who wants to push the limits in all types of waves. I mean, whether it be barrels, mm -hmm. big waves, small waves, um, you know, you have a hotbed of really good surfers in the area. You know, it's like, yeah, it's a place to grow up to be a surfer. I'll say that. Anyway, I loved it. Yeah. And I went and said, you know, and Santa Cruz, same thing, kind of at the same time. It was, you know, there was a lot of good surfers in town and they were pushing it. Uh, they're going all over the world, trying to at least, you know, and figuring out a way to surf more <laughs> and surf more around the world. Yeah. On the dream. Yeah. So who at, at that age, at 14, who, like you, you mentioned some of the guys that you went to the U S championships with, but like when you go back to Santa Cruz at that stage and what's the, uh, cause at this stage is Mavs even on the radar at 14? Like what, where, where's Ma Ma where's Mavericks? Like you haven't even heard of it, right? Undiscovered. Like, <laughs> undiscovered, like right? So there. like, yeah, it's incredible. So then, you know, like I'm guessing, you know, steam lane middles. I mean, there's a lot of ton of big waves around there, but as a 14 year old kid, and you know, if you've got your, you know, the kids that you're hanging out with, you know, you've always got kids that are pushing it harder or you got the crazy kids and you're trying to push even more, but like where, where, where does in Santa Cruz, what's the steps, you know, where, where's the steps that you start to go to, to start pushing yourself into that that bigger realm and and were there who are the heroes too like at that stage when you're 14 who are the guys are you looking up to well for me it was uh i'm trying to think at 14 it was still pretty it was more my peer group right which was adam galley mm. just i mean i could it's non-stop lawyer fleet There's so there. many everyone, yeah. everyone yeah it's a uh, rack boy <laughs> you know, just keep just start spitting them out um and all of them surfed well and, and was into it and pushing each other so there was like this kind of uh you know, peer group that was going off at that time. Um, but I looked up to the older guys, you know, that's what we were taught in Santa Cruz was to expect your, you know, respect your elders, um, you know, respect the people that have lived there and put their time in. Uh, and that's something that was kind of always instilled as well as it is to people on the North shore, you know, respect uh, Ina and the, and the people. So it was like one of those things that um, my elders were guys like Richard Schmidt. Matter of fact, I mean, Richard Schmidt's literally working with me right now like, on the other side of this wall doing his, surf school and we're partnered up on it and doing cool things together and this guy was the one who got me inspired to surf why man and surf sunset beach like he did vince collier another you gotta one you, was, uh, you gotta ask him you gotta ask him if he'll come on the podcast for me <laughs> okay <laughs> i want to get him on he's at a lesson right now but he'll come back and he's got a he's got two nine-year-olds right now that he's working <laughs> with his his kids right he's got makai and and uh richie you know his other son both of them are working right yeah. now with him like and i got my kids working. it's just wild it's kind of cool it's like, awesome. like I said, yeah after how many years it's just been happening that you're still here and you're still putting your head down and it's not as easy as it used to be i'll say that because this town is blown up you know it costs a lot to, to live here and similar to where you live you know similar to a lot of places yeah. where there's live <laughs> you know generally we like to congregate around places that are you know rich in weather and uh rich in culture and waves so you know here we are yeah. santa cruz in the <laughs> yeah you were saying that um you know guys like richard smith you were looked up to and then as you were like chasing the bigger waves around santa cruz itself yeah i mean then those were the guys that, it was steamer lane the west side you know i grew up um in in the south side right that's where i went to school so that was kind of my years of um i was growing up at the beach breaks down la selva beach and i had a group, group of friends that i would surf with most of that time until you know i obviously went to pleasure point because that's where our store was there was all the surfers that were from that area and the west side was kind of pretty far away right <laughs> it felt like it was pretty far away and so i didn't really start hanging out with the west side crew until like like about after high school right that's that's when you know we started mingling way more together as far as a, a, a group just driver's license and uh, chasing waves up and down the coast all the best surfers end up at the best waves and you know steamer lane is always good yeah tr who was pushing it with you know um, starting to do all the filming and stuff like that and that was kind of vhs mecca time right you had the kill you know josh palmer doing his thing kind of you know slightly afterwards so there was this kind of production of you know video content coming out of this region so we kind of were and and the industry at that time was kind of allowing for these regional pros to have kind of some 
success. You know, we were able to get a, you know, a few hundred bucks or whatever to, to get us through and be surfers for a job. And that's what was happening. And, you know, I was still here with, with um, my dad. And he was obviously very helpful as far as, you know, getting my career going because he would be here working at the shop and I would just, you know, be cruising mm. <laughs> around the world. And, and, and I asked, I, had, I mean, I had a little salary that came with it. Um, but I always remember that that the peer group that we all had, we were pushing it no matter what, right? We were going out there trying to do the biggest airs in front of the camera with the crew that we were with, or even a session, even without the cameras, we were always trying to um, one up each other. And, and that translated into stuff when it got bigger. And that's when Mavericks kind of came in. It was more in the 20s, you know, it was like, um, you know, it was 90 really was the very first year. So, you know, we we're 20, 21 at that point when Mavs all of a sudden was like, well, what's that thing, you know? And, um, yeah. And, just took it from there. There was a that crew, you know, started going up together and yeah. and riding big waves up there. And that was a that was a really um, very talented um, and a lot of them, right? So it was a lot of good yeah. surfers uh, that were up there pushing it, um, you know. And again, I could just name names, but it, it, it went yeah. all. It was a full spectrum too, because there was Richie was up there and Vince Collier were leading it, and uh, so we were in a situation where it was just you know I, we followed what those guys were doing. Yeah. So at, um, you know, at that stage from like that mid teenage years, are like, are you actually, is that like you're in high school, you finished high school, are you, is pro surfing, is that the focus? Like, is that the goal, you know, at that, at that time is to be, you know, like is college a goal or is it like Pete Mel, like I'm going to be a pro surfer, you know, especially with everyone around town that's like, that was so good. Um, and they, they, like you said before, that, that were the glory years. There's a lot of, a lot of money being, you know, thrown around and, a lot of people were sponsored, so um, I'm wondering if mum and dad were like, "Hey, Pete, you got to get a college degree as, as, before you go surfing," or it was like, "You're like, hey, I'm I'm going to be a surfer." Um, it's a little bit of both. I mean, there was a time when I, I did go to college. I went to Cabrillo, which is basically an extension of high school. It's a really good, you know, junior college, but. I didn't take it super seriously because I was, I ended up traveling a lot and I was doing the same thing where I missed some school and trying to make it up. And then you drop a class and you know, anyway, it just came out to one yeah. of those things where it was sometimes one of those deals where it was, uh, you ended up, um, <laughs> having, uh, yeah. Anyway, it, it was, it's just a, a long story, Jamie, long story. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So basically uh, surfing was the goal. It was, it was. It, yeah, hundred percent it was. Um, but I also was doing a lot of things around, uh, around surfing others. I mean, I started shaping a little bit. Uh, I did yeah. do some retail in here. I did ding repair. I've done, you know, so like you end up yeah. doing, oh, I partied a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I traveled a lot. I went, I was competing too, you know, I wasn't, it was, uh, you know, that back then it was like the world tour. Was, you're being a you know, you were, you were being a teenager. You were being a teenager. Yeah. 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 And I, and I, you know, yeah. luckily, I did have the support of them because I was being, I was around enough to help around the house and help around the shop um, and also get, get some trips underway. And there was some sponsorship there. There was enough money. You make some photo incentive and, you know, some contest incentive. You were, you were pulling it, you know, and it wasn't, didn't yeah. cost a lot of, you know, rent a room for 600 bucks or whatever it is. And all that way I was, I was living life and it was, um, yeah, it was good, but carefree. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then at that stage, is that, you know, when you went to Hawaii at 14, is, was that from that stage on, was that, is that a consistent pil pilgrimage now for you at that, that stage? Were you going each season after that? So, you know, your heavy water experience, obviously, even though Mavericks hadn't sort of appeared on the map, but you're coming to Sunset, you're probably surfing Pipe, you're surfing Waimea. I'm guessing um, in your late teens, you're probably even starting to maybe look at some outer reefs on Hawaii. A little bit, yeah, um, for sure. At that point in time, I mean, it wasn't, it didn't need to at the time because it was really, I was just thinking, wow, if even surfing Hawaiian Man was, you know, a, mm. a challenge in its own. Um, but Sunset was really the spot that I pushed myself more than anything just because, um, you know, there's a lot of those days that were like the, and it felt like every day was like this, but it was where it was like that 12 to 15 foot, right? Where it's like kind of washing through, but there's some good ones in it sunset, but you're paying for them, right? That's one of the mm -hmm. days that I used to love going out in. Um, Cause it was, if you knew what was going on and you knew the swell direction or knew whatever, sorry about that. We are a business. That's so right. I have yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 
you know, it, it, that kind of surfing was taught you a lot about the ocean, right? The rips moving, you're taking them on the head, you're finding out stuff like you're bailing and looking under, you know, waves and you're just learning. You're learning a lot in that time. And that was something that was very valuable to me to be able to be more comfortable in the lineup. Cause you know, sunset, it pounds you. It's big waves. These come, waves come out of the West, yeah. you know, you got inside bowl that they'll slam you, you know, that, that was an insane training ground for me. Um, cause yeah. we, that's what we would do is ride seven tens and, you know, eight O's and go and paddle huge sunset and get pounded for it and love every minute of it. So that was something that all of us did, you know, <laughs> as you know, yeah. I had a group, well, of guys, I went from the South side that were like Eric Davis and Mike Kretsch were the guys I went to the North shore with and spent time with. Um, and there was other surfers that all visited as well, but those were the guys we just grovel and all rent a car or buy a car and hang out in one room. <laughs> it was radical time. but so fun because. Uh, that's all you're doing is surfing every day. Yeah. I mean, I think sunset is one of those unforgotten, you know, now with the realm of what everyone thinks big is, you know what I mean? But, you know, sunset will, will humble you really fast. And I like, I feel like if I get a, a, there's a week of sunset, you know, in November, that's like anywhere from eight feet to 12 feet, you know, it's eight feet ten for a week. And I go surf that every day. Like I feel ready like more than anything, you know, because you do pay the piper there. And when it is that 12 to 15 and it's washing through, like, and you really look at like, especially guys, like, like when I was growing up in Australia, like the guys that were really good at sunset and stuff like Kong and Mungabari and snake and like, like Tony Ray and like all those guys were really good. Just watermen as well. You know, like it, it takes a lot to find good waves at sunset, like good sunset surfers. They're like, Don't forget yeah, Ross like, Clark jump. Ross Clark as well, yeah. Like they're sneaky, you know what I mean? you got to know when to zig and zag out there, when to jump in and, and dive around, and guaranteed you're going to get cleaned up, you know. But the place is super hell. I had a couple of pretty bad, bad experiences there this year, towards the end of the year in April when it was bombing, you know. So it's a, it's an incredible playing ground. It's, um, yeah. I think it's underrated. The whole you know? North Shore is, I think. You know, the whole North Shore is. I mean, think about Pipeline and Waimea and the Outer Reefs and – you know what you guys have to do in the summer you guys are just now foiling and gliding along the ocean it looks like you've been having fun man you want to come a little switch roles and I want to do. <laughs> let me go fly on the ocean for a little bit you can do some uh, yeah some people management here and uh, freelance some shop. retail <laughs> sorry so I feel so okay angry and a little irritated sometimes <laughs> i've been people right. managing positive, for a while positive pete it's positive cool pete, remember? You know? Hey, there's a lot of people that I laugh and have fun. There's a lot of people that I'm like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So we've gone through that stage. How, I, I, I'm interested in like this. The, I mean, obviously Mavericks is a massive part of your story. And um, what, what, do you remember when it was like, when it was like you, someone like the whisper of like, hey, there's, there's a wave 45 minutes away that's, is like why I'm here, you know, like, and just from hearing that to like how, how it took you guys to get up there or you, your, your first time at least like that process of elimination and just, you know, what it took for you to get up there that first time and paddle out like that, that really interests me. I think the, the story, right. Is, is the funniest thing is like the coconut wireless and how surfing and stories go, you know, like this was, you know, basically this story has been told, but it's the truth. And it's really, really cool. Is it, you know, there's um, brother, right? Uh, Dave and Richie Schmidt. Um, and actually it's, it was more Dave Schmidt that went for the first time with Vince Collier and Tom Powers. They were up at o Ocean Beach looking at it, it was huge. Jeff Clark was there. Um, and Jeff's like, ah, you don't want to paddle out here. I got this other spot down the coast. Let's go down and check this spot down the coast. It'll be perfect today. And they went down there and they happened to have a little bit of video of that first session. But the story came first before the video did, right? So we got to hear about this spot that came down the lane. I think it was really literally a couple of days afterwards, they were talking, Dave was talking to me about this wave. And he's like, it's legit, it's legit. And he's got this, you know, it's in his eyes. You could just go, oh, okay, yeah. this sounds. And there, I, I mean, I'm trying to think if I'd even heard of it before then, but I don't think so. I, you know, and I mean, I drove that coast up and down. And I mean, one of my first surf contests was at uh, Lindemar Beach. Was So, I mean, I. I've been up there. I've been seeing the area and never really heard about Mavericks being ridden until that session. Um, did come to find out that Jeff had surfed it before that, but uh, he was doing it on his own. So that was wild. And, but those guys mm. came back to town. Um, 
and told the stories of this wave that was legit and it was as, as you know gnarly and as perfect as you could imagine it was you know and that was vince telling the stories too and he was super animated the way he told stories you know so we all were kind of hooked and he was the first kind of band leader that brought up a group of guys and one of my first sessions was on a borrowed vc um you know i ended up getting boards built for it and you know like all of that era is kind of a blur i wish i had a just pinpointed perfect time frame of what all these flashes in my head that would come over the years of you know that old time frame like my first wave i don't even really remember my first wave which is kind of weird but mm. maybe it wasn't very maybe it wasn't very classic and that's why i didn't remember it but yeah. um either way i mean there's been many since <laughs> you know so um yeah, it was a time frame that a lot of, again, just the peer group, everyone making an effort to do it and go up there and, and figure it out. And we, we did it as a, as a group and it was um, really cool. I mean, I think that we all can understand that there's a collective that happens with, with surfers if, in a region or, I mean, you'd see it in Maui, you see it at Jaws, you see it at, um, you know, anywhere there's big waves, you know, South Africa, you know, Dungeons, all that crew, they push each other. And that group has to have that kind of collective and it's helpful when you have people that are out there not only having your back but also pushing you to go on it and, t and find out what's possible right and yeah. i value you too me and you have a great relationship because of that we have a connection that you know no other it's an unsaid connection that we've um, shared mm -hmm. forever um so i mean i can't I, I don't talk to you for months on end it doesn't matter <laughs> you know we're yeah, still yeah yeah we're still connected and 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 you know and then we talk to each other it's like oh yeah same same stuff Just yeah get caught up with... anyway what's so what on. i mean it, yeah i mean it, it seems like and you know there's so many good guys i'm not sure when they all started you know but you know skinny rapogo i mean um flea barney i mean it just i can't there's yeah, just so many good guys that warm up you can just yeah. keep going the worm alts and desmond mm -hmm. i mean it just it's incredible you know but um but i think what is pretty you know um you know well documented is that you and you and flea really like push each other it seemed like mm -hmm. you you two guys were the ones who were trying to one up each other that potentially like you know and you yeah you know, you're always those, there's those guys that are always they may be pushing each other but collectively like you're, you're sucking everyone else along even if they don't know it you know because <laughs> because like you know where you're surfing is like okay i'm surfing and in good just ways and ball. in bad ways too right yeah and in good, well, ways, in good and ways and bad ways that's that's for sure you know but you know in the in the history of it it's like it, it happened yeah. right it, it happened it's it, it is what it is you know and 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 you know everyone else got sucked along for the ride and started probably without even knowing themselves got sucked along and started pushing their limits as well you know like how how was that with like what was the relationship with flea you know like was it this in the water it was sort of like um you know like trying to one-up each other like everyone does in big ways we got massive egos we all do like yeah. let's just be that's honest with say, it, it and and it's flared up egos having hanging out with each other yeah. the best of friends but we also wanted to be the best best of friends right like literally we we did it all we fought we partied we uh charge big waves together we you know did everything for a period of time there it was pretty raw and radical um and got us into mm. trouble a little bit luckily i was able to steer out of it you know and same same with flea yeah. i mean now flea's killing it and i'm so lucky to be on the other side of that kind of bad side of it um but the you know the positives came out of it were where there was, like you said, a, a full collective of everyone else that kind of followed. And also people are learning from it going, I ah, probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, the learning. I guess I, guess I, I got, I got one, I got one. I'm just going to ask one, one question about the, the parting and stuff. Then I'll, then I'll leave it be, but I've always, uh, I don't think I've ever asked you, but, um, like actually paddling like you guys were do you guys after a big night of partying like it, it just happened to be like a mass show you guys like paddling out the next day still like sort of on the on the party train i'm, I'm just because i can't even imagine trying to surf mavericks like yeah. without being fully clear-minded uh, you basically you know, asked me if i I'm, surfed out there high and um i'm sure yeah there was basically some moments, yeah you yeah, no, I, there was some moments of me being on high, but it wasn't something I was doing while I was out there going, oh, I got to get high to do this, right? Um, yeah, no. It was a, there were leftovers or, uh, yeah, it was, it, it happened, I'm sure. Um, it's it's yeah. it was more probably, it, for me, it'd actually be after was when it would happen, right? So you'd have this thrill. Well, you and the, the adrenaline, the, the adrenaline, then the dump. Keep trying to keep it going. Giant. 
yeah. grasping yeah. at it to keep it going because you get this such a, a natural adrenaline filled you know high from life that mm -hmm. you're wanting to somehow I, mean, I don't know why you would connect that kind of a high to some, you know some other high yeah. but there's some similarities to it or whatever it just gets dragged in there yeah. people everyone else was kind of involved and i was you know doing it um yeah yeah so it it, it wasn't something that was that we did it to enhance at all it was more just to keep it kind of going on the back end at least that's how i remember yeah it. it's not like i need to i need to do this to go and surf the waves because i'm scared shitless and i don't want to be out there you know it's like yeah. it was just a byproduct of everything else that was going on in, around at the time so um what yeah, was I mean, what was it sorry go ahead go ahead no i was just like i was just reflecting on some of the stuff like of you know like as we are now i'm 50 right um mm. and it's one of those things where uh you start having people around you that are you know passing away and like having issues and like it's kind of radical like you, you know how short yeah. life is and you know how to be able to have that's made me grateful to be where i'm at now and know that i didn't hurt anybody or you know beyond myself probably a little bit um through those times because it could have been i could have easily been you know, yeah. in a bad situation at the wrong time and had something happen tragic because of of what i was doing partying and being irresponsible so yeah uh, i like i said I'm, I'm now thinking about that going i'm super grateful that i was able to kind of get through it without you know like i said without hurting myself and it's made me now have a you know different perspective on you know life i have now yeah. now straight pull, trying to pull it off and be I'm growing up jamie i'm growing up I'm yeah. trying to <laughs> yeah well how, how long how long sober now it's like what is it like 12, uh you 13, know 14, um, long time it, and, and it, flee I, as well I, like I, it's such a good thing let's be honest here okay i'm gonna be honest with you I, and i say is that i yeah. i um, don't haven't had alcohol or drugs in a long time. Now I do partake in some edibles occasionally and uh, occasionally have done that, but I've kept that one as a minimum and it is legal, right? But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, generally to be sober, you, you have to be completely yeah. flat and that's not the case for me. Um, but I don't drink and I don't do drugs. Um, I don't stay up all night. So those are the things yeah. that have uh, got me into trouble. So um, I stay away from that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's say good good on you and good and good on flea too like i'm gonna I eventually want to have flea on the podcast as well because i think his story is just as radical and and just you know and what he's done to to turn you know to do the flea hub and all that like to turn what his negative into a positive and i think that's really it's awesome it's freaking it's um yeah. it's amazing that he's been able to do that and i know he's got two daughters i think he's got daughters two daughters yeah. one daughter and he's the best but, you know, dad ever like you dude best yeah. dad ever just enter you know not all about like they surf a little bit but they camp they go out to dinners out in the you know, it's awesome what he does for those daughters yeah i'm gonna get him on for sure so so then when when does the first map is a when the is it men who ride mountains that was the first ever quicksilver right uh yes. two, 2000 am i am i right or wrong? Uh, was it dude, the early two uh, yeah we let's get ask uh memory bank <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to pull it out for you, but it's, it's right there in that same era. Um, you know, it was, it was developed, um, out of Quicksilver, a bunch of brains behind it there that, you know, obviously the Eddie was happening at that time and there was some good success behind that. Um, I'm trying to think there was a couple of events that had happened, right? So there's a little surge at that time. I think, uh, you remember the Eddie kind of kicked in, there was like two years, three years where it went for a couple of years in a row. Yeah. I think, um, I think, uh, that was the year that, uh, I think Noah Johnson won in 99 yeah. Right, yeah. and maybe Millennium. Ross, maybe back to back yeah. Ross, Ross won 2000 maybe or something. But there, I know what you said. Yeah. There was a lot of momentum because the Eddie had run maybe twice in three to four years, which is sort of unheard of now. <laughs> yeah right and and so with that there was a momentum behind big waves um it was a great era again i, I just signed with quicksilver in 97. um so that was kind of three years into the relationship things were you know at mavericks were pretty cool they had jeff clark kind of on board and boom um helped develop you know his, his wife at the time catherine clark was a big part of it uh and all the surfers and developed you know men who ride mountains and uh, Quicksilver backed it in a big way and uh, did some pretty cool stuff. We had, remember, we had jackets. Remember the jackets? I'd actually nice. love to see it. Had, there was like a red jacket that they had for the winter that was here at Carryover, kind of like the green jacket, but it was this maroon jacket. Yeah, for the awesome. Masters. Everyone, right. everyone got one. And a little men we ride mountains. I mean, there's a few of those floating around. Those would be a, a good item to have around. Uh, anyway, uh, 
that was, you know, again, big waves were kind of in a, in a full surge and, and big wave competitions were something that was kind of cool and it was happening then. And Flea, that's when Flea went on his rampage, right? He won the first the first one and then did he win th- three in a row, was it? Or th- yep. He, or did he, he win did. them back to back? Yeah. yeah, three peat, full on. I mean, he dominated every event that happened, he won. You know, he even won yeah. with Kelly Slater, right? So um, that was uh, an era. He knew how to compete. He knew when to turn it on and he did it in a fine fashion. And I don't know of anybody. I mean, right now you got Billy Kemper who's kind of trying Billy. to... Uh, yeah. you know, dominate a place like Valley, it's um, just like Flea did it at Mavericks. Yeah. What was, what was, what made Flea, um, what was his biggest strength, do you think? You know, was it just, was he just the willingness to put himself in those positions to get those, you know, those waves? And obviously he had plenty of skill, you know, I, was, I mean, to, to, to do it as well, but he seemed like he was willing to put himself, you know, in those spots to get those type of waves. Yeah. And, and that took, you know, a lot of courage and a lot of experience and he was really good at it. You know, he loved it. He, um, he, he relished in pushing it and, and being the guy that got the biggest and the best waves. And uh, he did it mm-hmm. very often, especially when it came into competition. I mean, it was a, it was just a pure, like he turned it on. He knew how to turn it on. Yeah. And, uh, and he still does, but, uh, yeah. now he does it, you know, in different ways, but, um, yeah, yeah he did uh, did a lot. I mean, you think about the the wave um, that he jumped off the ledge at uh, Eddie at YMN. Remember, I mean, that one is. I don't know if you could top that one. I was pretty mental, so the guy went for it. <laughs> yeah, he went for it. Um, and then, so so they're they're the early paddle days, and because I want to try and um, transition, because you were right in that. Um, I think it was such a, a cool time in big wave surfing with the revolution of towing. You know, so when, what was it that made you guys go, we're going to get skis at Mavericks? Was it like uh, the guys with Laird and Dave and that? Was it the guys that, you know, when Jaws came out, was that the the switch? Like what, what was, you know, what was that moment in time when you guys, because, you know, I, I know the same thing. I was like, as soon as I want it, knew what I wanted. It was like, I've got to have the ski. You've got to have this. And it was just like, no matter what, I had to get it all to be, to be ready, you know? So when, when is that for you guys? It was, it was the strap crew. You know, I, I was able to witness the very first time they did the Zodiac with double D at sunset point. I actually witnessed that with my eyes live. I was like, Whoa, that's kind of cool. Yeah. What, what year was that? That was like 90, right? So it took me uh, 89 or 90 that they did that. Right. So it was like, um, it might have even been earlier, to be honest. But either way, it took us till like 97 to get our stuff together. So we actually sandbagged. I mean, yeah, we watched it, but we just didn't know, right? I mean, yeah, we didn't have skis. We didn't, we just didn't know. We didn't care. We were doing other stuff, I guess, at the time. So um, it took Skinny and I to pick up a ski, but we were one of the first few guys to get skis early, you know, and it was, it took a little time and stuff. And we trained, we had a good place to train at the time. Um, so we learned how to drive the boats in and out of surf, which is key to know how to, to have that comfort. And then, um, you know, that's when we started going up there and, and riding, you know, I, I tried to do it in other places too. I mean, I went to Tahiti, um, and was doing towing then and that was kind of the very early days. So I just picked it up when I could, it wasn't something that I freaked out on. And then, like I said, when I finally bought my first ski, it was in 97 and, uh, I've had one ever since, I think at that point, and it's yeah. just a, a great cool to have for big wave surfing and especially you know now we we kind of have pretty major restrictions on the on boats in our area so we only can really go out at mavericks we don't have a training ground anymore to go and and ride the skis at least not in surf so uh, that was the training ground was the training ground moss landing is that where you guys went to sort of (laughs) i don't know what you're talking about (laughs) we Um, can't anymore there was a harbor yeah no there was a bunch of beach breaks that we were able to do it at right and um yeah that was kind of cool because we did, I mean, we, the, you know, at that point there was a jet ski zone, but we were exempt because we had three seaters and the way the definition was, it was two seaters. And anyway, it was one of those things where we were kind of, you know, getting away with it, I guess. And then it changed. They um, rewrote the restrictions and put us back in the boxes and Mavericks was kind of, you know, and that's a whole nother story. We don't even have to go into that, but I sat on a little board yeah. for all of that. That was an experience that, um, was a great training experience anyway in government um <laughs> i <laughs> yeah i uh 
I don't even know where I was going with this story, to be honest. Great, but, great, uh, great practice for your conditioner job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. Um, but that training ground. But, was so did you guys, were, did you guys see giant squalls before the skis? Like, you know, like you got like the surf's obviously giant and it's like a toe day. Like, you know, look at those DVDs from the curtain power lines and that, you know, 100 foot Wednesday um, down the line, yeah. those days. Like, were they, were they days when it was so big that you guys would get down there, think about paddling and be like, oh, it's too big to paddle. And then, and then it was like, all of a sudden you had the skis and you could go out after that. You look, as I remember it, um, I, I don't remember being paddling out there going, oh my God, I wish I had a ski ever really. Mm. Um, it felt like when those days, at least maybe those were a couple of years that it just wasn't a bunch of big days that were like freak out days. I mean, the one for me was, the 99 swell, um, which was really the first time I'd ever towed Mavericks huge. Um, yeah. That, and that day was, was uh, yeah, it was October 18th, 99. No, sorry, it was October 28th, 1999. It was 10 days after John was born, so I can remember that. But that day was something like we were, we just happened to be there, and that was the biggest I'd ever seen it, right? I'd never been out mm -hmm. there paddling going, oh my God, like we, we didn't want to even be near it. It was usually, yeah. it was just, yeah. So it's just a, I don't know, maybe I wasn't there. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't remember it ever being massive. It, was, it really came down to yeah. when I finally had the pieces when it, when it seemed like it got bigger. I mean, those were just years that were huge because I haven't yeah. seen it as big, as big before even now. Right. Like there's days like the day that we paddled, it was, it's just every huge, huge day is kind of different too. Right. It always has mm. a little something. With the way it breaks, the direction. Yeah. Exactly. I mean that that one that one year in um the you, you got a bunch of really good waves. Flair that horrible wipeout, the fogged in day. Um, I was yeah. there with Billy. Um, yeah. Two thousand and seven December, I think December fourth, two thousand and seven, and it was socked in with fog, and half the teams went to ghost trees, and half the teams stayed. And um, but that was again that was giant, but it was more so it was nearly so west that it was like. It was just so thick, you know. It wasn't. I, I wouldn't say it was like tall in a in a weird way. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Didn't oh, like dangerous. when you look at the footage, it, it's, but it was just super dangerous. There was so much water, yeah. and if you fell, you were just like through the rocks. There was like no, was like there was no coming <laughs> to get you. It was just like a Niagara Falls pushing you through the rocks into the lagoon. Yeah, yeah, pretty wild day. Remember that? That was a wild. Yeah, and that was, was the angle. Yeah, I think. but I mean, every big day, like I said, has a little something different to it. But that October 28th day was massive. It was big. It was breaking from way out and going all the way through. Like it was big and long. Whereas you're talking about the day we were, it was short and just compact and on itself. Um, you know, there was a day that I, I surfed it in January, what, two years ago, three years ago, that was massive. We paddled it. I mean, it would have been mm -hmm. nice to be able to tow that day just to be able to get a couple of waves that day. But I felt like we were going to get a couple of paddling and the only Lucas and, and uh, Ottman were the only guys who got waves that day, really, as I recall. Oh, no. Yeah. And, uh, so and Andrews got a wave. So, I mean, there was a couple of waves. Andrews, I didn't, yeah. I didn't get a wave. <laughs> well, you got cleaned <laughs> up. Why that? I got cleaned up. Was, I did. That was awesome. That was a big <laughs> one. That was a bit like you didn't get sucked over. That was, those ones were giant. So, is that so? That in probably that, the biggest in that, wave I've ever had. Probably. That was but, giant. That was huge. Yeah, no. It looked really approachable in the morning at that, you know what I mean? Until the, the south wind killed it. But that early morning, like, sort of, I think, snuck up on a lot of people. And, like, there wasn't really many takers. And then, Andrew's boat got sunk. Um, yep. the, rolled right. the boat in the channel. So was, there was some carnage that day. That was a wild day, huh? When was that? That was like two years, three years ago, right? Two, three years ago. Two, three years ago. I was, uh, yeah, I think it was the day of my birthday, January 18th, maybe. Was it January 18th or 19th? One of those days. But, but, um, so at that stage, are you, are you like, you know, the, you got the jet skis, the contest has started, like you're sponsored by Quicksilver. What was that sponsorship like? Was that, um, Cause let me go back here. Cause 1997, you won the Cold Water Classic, right? I knew Cold Water Classic. I was World Jungle at the time. Yeah, yeah. I was riding so like the World that, Jungle at the time. <laughs> at that stage, is that is that a? Did you ever have a QS dream? Like the QS, like CT, was that ever a twinkle in your eye, yeah. or was it all we more, were, more geared funny. towards waves? I think I, I always had that dream, I think, because there was guys like Galley who was getting his, his time on tour, right, was happening. Um, Adam Replogle was from Santa Cruz, made the tour. 
Um, and these were my peers that I grew up with. And so, yeah, I had aspirations of it. I mean, we followed the much as we could. We went around the world, went on legs, you know, the Australian leg or the European leg. And those were all insane experiences back in time of, you know, checking out the world and competing. And that was killer. So, yeah, I had a dream that I would love to be able to surf garage again. And, you know, um, yeah, I didn't I don't think I ever put in a complete and utter campaign, per se, uh, because it was like at that time it was like we were we were making videos, we were doing fun stuff. We were just, you know, it didn't have to be all travel competition full on. It was like, we were doing, we were exploring, checking out new stuff, doing all sorts of, you know, drove to Mexico on a ski. We did all sorts of different stuff because that was what the doors were opening for me. What the ski did is it opened the doors, to all these places that we could go to that you couldn't really get to otherwise um, and check out new, you know, and beach breaks and barrels and oh, it was awesome. Um, to be able to yeah. experience that that era because it was a little more freedom now now you can't really get away and do that as much um at least not here in santa cruz for sure so um yeah it was fun times at that at that era uh getting a lot of good waves yeah because i because i um if I, I remember rightly now like the first time that um you know that, you know there was that there was riding giants um you know, step into liquid. I, I met you through quick, I mean, in Quicksilver, we actually were doing a photo shoot and I actually can't, I, I can't remember if this was the first time it was, it was me, you, Kalama, we're doing a silver edition shoot in San Francisco um, and Bonga Perkins yep. and I, and Barrett Tester was um, running, running the ship on that. And I remember seeing a, a swell just, it was in October, it was in October, two thousand and. I, I want to say it was 2004 or five. I, I, I don't know exactly what day, day, what year it was, but, um, and I said, Hey, there's a, there's a swell, you know, Ma yeah, and I, asked you, I, only, I remember asking you guys, do you think Mavericks will break? And you're like, Oh yeah, there'll be some ways. And I was like, so I was like campaigning get a Barrett to let us <laughs> to, to go and surf. And so we ended up going, you took us, I remember borrowing, um, this board of yours that you got a ton of ways. It was a yellow JC that had a, um, a red quicksilver sticker on it. it had like a some sort of red um outlining but I, I remember that board and you gave me that board bonga paddled out on his longboard and i remember barrett was on his jet ski and so that was my my first ever time surfing mavericks was when, you, know, you took me out yeah it's my maiden voyage you know and um yep. and at that stage like you know like being living in australia you know at that stage i was just paddling and and sort of starting to wanting to do all this other stuff you know and for me like seeing you guys and you were already a legend bro and, you'd already paddled across the channel 10 times and smoked people Actually, yeah but that wasn't surfing big waves <laughs> but i just you know like <laughs> i just deal. remember like still I, extreme i just remember i remember watching um strapped and the lead movie and the power lines movies just religiously so much and um and and then you know obviously I guess what I'm trying to get at that at that stage, are you fully are you fully invested in big waves? Like it seemed like like everything it seemed like the Pete Mel business was sort of chasing swells, um, the eddy, big waves. You know, you're you're in that you're in that riding giants and step in the liquid. I think you know. So it seems like and you know it's the Mavericks crew and the Strap crew. Like you know what I mean. So it all seems like it's coming together as. Pete Mel, the big wave surfer, you know what I mean? Like I might, might I be wrong, biggest, but well, I, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd always had a joy to do it. So I was always kind of doing it, but I mean, cause I used to surf, sun, like I said, I was used to some sunset beach, surf sunset beach, um, a lot during those years. And that was kind of the, you know, big wave for me. Right. And a little bit of YMA when it broke, when I was there. Um, and then Mavericks was kind of in the mid twenties started. Uh, it didn't break a lot, but you know, we surfed it a couple times a year. Um, but that, yeah, the, the era of, I think the Eddie was what really kind of invested me full time into it because that was something that yeah. it was the event to be in. And I had like 97, I was an alternate. I hadn't rigged for, I hadn't ridden for Quicksilver. And then, um, <laughs> I was third alternate. And then I ended up the next year it ran, I think I got in and then, um, and that's when I started riding for Quicksilver at the time. And that was the first Eddie I'd ever surfed in. And that was, that was the one Noah one, right? So that would have been 99 or is it the millennium? One? Yeah. I can't remember. It was on new year's day. Yeah. Um, so it was, that was, um, I guess being invited in the Eddie, you, you're a big wave rider in a way, right? I mean, there's only 24 guys invited, um, a bunch of alternates that are all very, you know, worthy as well. So 
it's a very small elite crew that you're recognized, you know, especially coming from California, you know, like this was a Hawaiian mm. event. So it was, that was where Richie Schmidt was something that I looked up to because Richie was always the one from California that he had the year that he um, finished third, you know, like conceivably, um, you know, he, some of the waves he rode that day, he could have won. You know, like that was, that was, that was the Brock, Brock the Brock wipeout, yeah, right? That Brock, giant wave in Brock's barrel, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard. I've heard a lot of people say that he should have maybe won that that contest. Yeah, Richard, Schmitt. I mean, it's it, just the yeah, drops he I took. Mean, some of the some of the stuff he did during that day was groundbreaking. And um, anyway, that's what I looked up to. And then to be invited into that same event with him, and um, it was pretty awesome. So I did. Yeah, at that point, I guess I was kind of the you know recognized for a Mavericks guy who surfed big waves. It got invited to the Eddie. It's you know it was a good time and Quicksilver was behind big wave surfing in a big way. Uh, so it, it kind of really, it boosted my career and I was later, I mean, that's 20, 26, 27 years old that that's all starting to happen. Right. So, um, that's kind of late in that time era, like, you know, as far as yeah. like pro surf journey, you, know, you got to 30 years old. It was now it's your prime. You know, it wasn't back then. Yeah. I, was, I mean, I told straight before I signed with Quicksilver that I was too old. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Huh? You know, I'm just getting started, but that's kind of how it was. It was youth, super youth driven as it is still now today. You know, it's very young, hot up and coming um, surfer or skater or whatever. It's you're the hot item. Yeah. Well, it's amazing how one contest like the Eddie can drive um, a career or a passion or someone's drive to, to do that, you know, and, and same with Mavericks, you know, if you're living in South, if you're living in Santa Cruz or, San Francisco or around that, you know, like to get in to try and get into that contest is like a dream, you know, to, to, to a lot of kids as well, you know, and, and, you know, that the drive to just surf that spot religiously and work it out and to go out before the, you know, I mean, I went through that, you know, being, being out before the contest starts and trying to get one wave and trying to get a wave in between the semi and the final and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's, um, it can really like, just have you la so laser focused that there's, there's nothing else that matters, you know. And um, I love how big wave can big waves can do that to people, you know. And and like right in your like that growing up, like you're saying, you're late twenties and stuff. But even like um, you know, like there was a tow contest at Nelscott. I mean, I remember you picking me up at the airport from Brisbane one day, and we drove up to Oregon and we did, did that. And that that had already been going before that as well, you know. So there were events popping up, you know, because it was towing was you know popular and obviously paddling was still there but you know obviously Laird and Dave and all that strap crew Lickle and Rush and all that had like popularized it so much that towing was like you know sort of going through through the roof you know and um I think even they were even getting toe surfing we're getting did you, did you get a cover you got a cover at Mavericks at surfing yeah. I think um, oh, and then on the yeah. pulling in on the yeah yeah, yeah. on a sort yeah and then October. when did that was October yeah, 28 yeah that was that with day, yeah. And okay, what about um, yeah, what about uh, because in this time frame as well, I'm guessing Cortez, right? Or, uh, yeah, Cortez was, pops up on that on the. Yeah, um, that was a kind of a, a different time too. So we were working at the time we were working on the film Step Into Liquid with Dana Brown and the Strap Crew, and that was all happening during that winter. Um, and we were actually meant to surf Mavericks. I think we're going to run the Mavericks event. That's what it was. Um, they were talking about it and that swell was perfect for Cortez Bank and they were talking about going out there and that mission. And um, I kind of just said, well, uh, this is an opportunity I can't pass up. And I, you know, I thought it was going to be, I don't know why we thought that the contest wouldn't run. I think it was more focused on down there. It wasn't as big as it was, you know, forecast to be, I think, or whatever, like we didn't think it was going to be on, but they ended up not having the event. And we went out there and it was obviously the day that um, they felt filmed uh, and step into liquid, but that was not really part of the script. It just kind of happened where the, you know, skinny and I were, were going out there and um, we took off and those guys were part of the film and we're like, Hey, we're going to follow you out there, you know? And uh, they ended up going out there and getting all that footage, which was amazing footage. Uh, but it, it just was, a, a you know, like surfing always is just stuff happened. Right. And, and Dana happened to be there for that part of it. And that was just a, gra a rad time, you know, too bad we didn't get like a Laird and, and that crew to be there, but it just didn't work out at the time. And what's, um, is that the big, they scored. 
Yeah. Was that, is that the way that Parsons posted not long ago on his Instagram, that giant one that, yeah, I mean, to, I, I look at that and just like, when you really take a second to look back at that wave and you're like, well, it could yeah. be one of the biggest waves still ever ridden. You know what I mean? Like it's straight up. And then, I mean, I hear the stories too of like other waves that never even got filmed or, and on previous trips as well with Greg and Twiggy and stuff that, you know, people couldn't even see the guys in between waves in the front and just like there was waves that have been ridden out there that didn't even get shot that were just ginormous. Yeah, no, I agreed. You know, and I, I still think there's days like that coming, you know, and there's going to be a crew yeah. that's going to do it at some point. Yeah. We'll what, was that, what, was that to, what was that time like that first time for you guys going out there into the unknown? Like had, oh. you, had you seen some footage? Like it was like going into yeah. outer space, right? Like going to the moon. Yeah, I mean – You've seen like footage from Larry, the Larry Flame, the, the yeah. um, more just from airplane, you know, right? So just airplane, from airplane, right? Footage, no. yeah, the single shot, you know, pictures basically, a little bit of video, but not much. So I mean, it, yeah, for sure, it was like going to a, a place. That, I mean, considering especially that usually you have some sort of land around you where you surf, this wasn't, yeah, none of that. It was. Uh, you know, horizon everywhere he looked. So it was wild in that sense. Uh, you got out there. I mean, you got a sense of like where you think land would be because you see waves breaking and all that, but um, very exciting um, and just perfect conditions when you were out there. So it was, it was a, an experience I'll never forget. And even getting out there was an experience. Um, mm. You know, the crew that, that took us out there were, um, were young and, and they were fired up and it was just cool. I mean, Evan Slater paddled that day. Remember John Walla, who was the captain. Oh, the that's when they got cleaned they, up, they, right? They paddled that day, right? And they were like, hey, and we were just towing, having a ball. Um, I mean, that that's pretty much what you would want to do out there at Cortez Bank. It's not much of a, I mean, paddling it is very, very challenging and very, very um, incredible. But if you want to have fun, you might as well grab a tow rope. Woohoo! Yeah. Miss well, it. we went out that other time. We went out that other time, remember, on Rob Brown's boat. And um, the, the saw that Greg had his accident. Yeah, that was another one. And that was, I mean, you yeah. know. Luckily, we had skis, and luckily, we had really, yeah. really um, good security with the with the, um, the brothers, you know, the Walsh brothers there. I mean, it was yeah. um, we we were, could have very easily lost Greg, actually. Um, yeah, so for sure, yeah, another wild experience that we've we've uh, gone through in big waves. Mm. And then when did um the you, I think you won. Um, you, you won Pico Alto, right, in two thousand eleven. So that was when Gary started the, the the tour. What do you remember? What year he actually started the first one? What was it? Because you were the third. Were you the third champ or? Uh, shoot, no. I think I, I you got me there, dude. Carlos, um, I, I don't Carlos, really know. Carlos, was, yeah. I know he won. Uh, Jamie Sterling won. Yeah. So I would say yeah, probably the third or um, then, fourth. Yeah. But uh, I mean. I think it all really started actually was when Gary pulled off the Toto Santos event. That was the ISA event, which was the international, you know, surfing association, big wave event. That was kind of the start of the big wave tour where he brought, you know, teams from around the world and we were yeah. at Toto Santos. That was kind of one of the first, like I quote unquote, that Gary put together as an international big wave event. Um, and that's the one that Taylor got his K2 award, right? The exactly. same day. So I don't know. Yeah. I'll try to think what that year was, it would have been probably 90, 98, maybe. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, that, that was the first big wave tour event. Right. And I think that then he, you know, he started, you know, researching other events that were happening around the world that were kind of localized, local big wave events. And he, um, started some events and that was kind of the start of the tour. Um, you know, then it took uh, many years later to finally, you know, win and actually have a big way event. But that you think about that dream has been going on for a very long time from, from Gary Linden. And he's the one who's really been the backbone of this thing. And he's still part of it. Uh, amazingly yeah. enough. So, uh, you know, good on Gary for persevering. I mean, I'd love to have the tour back someday. I think it's something that's fun and rad and, um, you know, something to follow that people would attach themselves to because it's kind of a cool thing, but we all know how hard it is <laughs> to, to pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. I had Gary in the podcast last week, actually. So we had a, we had a really good chat and um, he sort of gave his, the timeline of everything and how it all started, which was really cool. So it'd be a good, a good listen to anyone that wants to hear the history of um, not just big ways, but sort of more of the scene and why his vision oh, yeah. was 
yeah. needed to compete and have a winner and all that stuff, you know. So it's a it's a really good I had a really good conversation with him. Yeah, it was the show, and he knew about the show. He, I mean, he like again, he's been part of competitive surfing like if, for a long time. Really did the re- Yeah, you do some research on what this guy's been a part of for a very long time. Um, you know, and he's done it. You know, every year thanklessly really to be honest you know and, and yeah. like that, persevering, persevering still to this day so thank you gary linden yeah thanks oh well let's we're talking about contests let's go through your competitive history we spoke about the cold water classic so that must have been that's got to be cool to win that right to be able to say that you won that in the backyard like it's sort of bragging rights let's and let's clarify okay so um it wasn't actually a cold water classic which is a interesting okay. one but at the time right there was a few years there where um it was run as an independent event from o'neill right uh mm-hmm. you know the, we all just kind of lump it is in a santa cruz event it's at steamer lane um yeah so yeah i mean it was called the clarion open i think it was at the time right yeah and uh of course, it was still an international event. There was still good surfers in it. Um, so I like to think that that was still a good wind, <laughs> even though it wasn't a cold water. Um, and I actually did do it on one of my own shaped boards, which is actually pretty cool, too, because, um, you know, that there was, at least in that time, there wasn't a lot of surfers that were riding their own shaped boards. At, and, you know, Richie Collins was one. There was a few still, but um, there wasn't a lot. And it used to be the case, right, in the um, 70s and 80s that, everyone kind of made their own boards and competed on it, which was kind of cool too in its own right. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Those days now are, I mean, when you don't have anybody on tour, they're shaping their own boards. So, I mean, I don't think they have time, but yeah, uh, maybe they actually do have time. I don't know. <laughs> There's a few oh. good surfers out there that I ride, you know, shaper surfers, which are, I think are something that is unique and really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then, so 2011, you win Pico Alto. Um, in Peru and from winning that event, I'm not sure how many events there were that year, but you actually end up being the champ, the world big wave world champ in 2012. Yes. I think there was three events that year, if I'm not mistaken, maybe two, to be honest. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I know Chile? that there was, yeah, well, Chile. I mean, that was the one I, I, I made the final and I'm trying to think, yeah, I probably would have made the final in Chile. And then I, and then I won Peru and then they didn't have an event at the end of the year. I think it was, I don't know if Mavericks was one of them, but either way. Um, yeah, I ended up, you know, becoming a, a world champion in a funny, you know, unique way. And it was um, something that I always valued because I, I had the same dream that Gary did to, to see like this thing come to fruition where he had a world champion in big waves. And it was something that you, if it just had, you know, kept going and it still is kind of keep going. I still think that there's um, some validity to it. I mean, I know that now it's like really the only one event is Piaohi, but it would be nice to be able to have a few more events. And I think they'll come back yeah. um, at some point. I think the value is just too high not to. Uh, at least, you know, it may take a few years, but it'll probably happen again. Um, but yeah, that, that was a pretty unique experience to be, you know, crowned a world champion. And in that era, we were all supporting it as athletes, really, more or less. There wasn't a ton of money involved. It wasn't like I got a $100,000 check for winning. It was, uh, I got a yeah. nice balsa, hand shaped balsa board by Gary Linden, which I still have in the store right now. Um, uh, I got a signed board from all of the athletes. It was kind of cool. Um, so yeah, I treasure that, that world title very much. And I think it's really cool that, you know, if you look what happened after that, right, become a world champion and then start helping, you know, the, the tour, uh, you know, when it gets transferred hand into the WSL and helping with all that, like it was a great experience to try and grow it further. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I like to think, I like to think that we did a good job at it. Um, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll get into that. But I mean, you, you did, you, and then the next year, actually, probably. I mean, I, I'm guessing. I mean, I was, I was there, so I could tell. I was, I was chatting <laughs> to you that day. I'm pretty. I think sure. your memories is probably smart. <laughs> no, no, I remember. But 2013, you finally got the monkey off your back and won Mavericks. Yep. Yeah, and um, and I, it's funny. Every I, big wave event I've ever won, Jamie. Let's be honest here. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, I, I came in thinking that I didn't win. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know I won. It wasn't like I was like, yeah, I killed that yeah. one. I was literally like, yeah. huh? I won? Really? Oh, well, man, that's cool. And I if mean, I, yeah, I, do you, I think if I remember, and again, let's talk about it, all our memories being foggy all the time, but I think that <laughs> I want to yeah. say that they, I want to say they didn't. This year was, um, they had the back, the back car park of the, um, 
what's the nice hotel there? Um, I keep uh, <laughs> Coastside. Uh, no. no, no, the, the, the really nice, beautiful one, the big white one that on the. Um, can't believe I'm blanking on the name, but anyway, they had the um, big setup out the back. They had a big screen, big stage, food, everything, and I don't think they told you got no, no one knew who won, so they got you. I'm pretty sure they got you up on stage, and they called out sixth place, fifth place, fourth place, all the way through. And I'm pretty sure that you found out on stage at that moment. Now, again, I, I mean, could be I, wrong. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, people I, are talking, whatever, you know. But like, I mean, they're trying to, they're trying to, they're trying to do the, the 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 shock factor. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And 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 I don't think anyone really truly believes they won until. I mean, maybe not, but. For me, I didn't think you truly won until they announced it, right? So um, I think that was definitely when it really did sink in. I think I remember on the boat ride in, someone saying over the radio that um, that I had won. But I, you know, mm. again, you don't believe it. And I, and I truly, I, I was it. like that. That I mean, I remember as that final was kind of slow. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't a you know pumping. Final. As a matter of fact, the whole event wasn't really that big. I did have a pretty cool drop you know, during that event. Um, one really late one that I was able to like get underneath and thing landed on my head, but, and that was kind of critical as I remember. Um, but it wasn't yeah. a gigantic wave and it wasn't, the whole event wasn't gigantic. So, uh, not to discredit it, but I wish it would have been 20 foot and when, you know, or 2010 yeah. when, uh, yeah. you know, that was amazing. Anyway, um, it was a win and yeah, monkeys yeah. off the back and it was, a, you know, it was kind of cool, you know, to, to feel yeah. like it could actually win a contest and especially at a place like Mavericks where, um, I heard many times, oh, yeah, you should, how come we haven't won? You know, whatever it yeah. is, which doesn't, shouldn't matter. But Yeah, well, it feels, and, you know, I think it's more, yeah, the pressure from um, sometimes from other people and it's just, you know, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to end it with like being the guy that like, you're the best guy that never won. <laughs> that would just yeah. suck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like hearing that for a little bit, whatever. you know, but whatever. But I mean, it must, it must yeah. feel good. I mean, to put it to, to like Mavericks is such a, you know, like a, um, a storied place in your in your story in your life story like that place like whether you think about it now or not you know but when it's all said and done like god man that 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 one piece of reef <laughs> you know has had so much has, has had so much influence and good times like with so many people including yourself so to, to actually like to, to win an event must must be really cool i mean i know i was i mean i think everyone was stoked for you you know i mean i don't think yeah. there was anyone that went Nah, fuck, you know, Pete, you know what I mean? I think everyone was really stoked. Right? Anything in that event, did I burn anybody? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, <laughs> I remember. Uh, yeah, no, of course it is. And, and that's why, I mean, it's great. It's a, it's a great uh, feather in the cap. And, you know, I hope to have a bunch more killer times up there too soon. So um, Yeah, you know, it's not over. Austin. Well, I mean, we're... In saying that, where are you? Like, where 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 is Pete Mel's headspace? I know you you just turned fifty. Yeah. Congrats on making fifty. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and that's cool. you know, and but you know, like you say, big wave surfers, man. It's a, there's a lot of it's a lot, a lot of ex, it's a lot of experience and you know, knowing the lineups and knowing what wave to go and what waves not to go. And I know your son now, John, is surfing it, and that's probably given you another recharge. Like not only I guess wanting to be out there to protect him in a fatherly sense, you know, and show him the ropes, but also maybe another little revamp in like, hey, I can, I've still got some, I still got some good waves in me. Like, is where, where is your head like coming? I know we're in a crazy time right now, but where's Pete Mel's headspace coming into this to this season? Is he going to be chasing waves? Does he want to go surf Piahi? Does he want? <laughs> I don't know if that's part of it. Mavericks, I think, is still a definite part of the story. I mean, I do have two brand new Mavericks coming. So, um, you know, Britt, thank you very much. Uh, he's uh, got a, a new 9.8 and a new 10.0. So those are coming. Um, some of the best boards I've ever had uh, in Big Wave Realm, you know, besides that JC has actually been my latest Mavericks are incredible. Um, yeah. Those guys have done a great job building out some boards and, you know, they're still in one piece. They haven't broken. They're still insane and they work in everything. So i um, pretty stoked on that. And, and I feel like a couple new boards would be helpful, but uh, you know, this retail training stuff ain't cutting it, <laughs> you know? So I think that I do need to be a little bit more conscious of that coming up um, that, 
you know, just making sure my body's a hundred percent because, uh, you know, it, it, you're doing that kind of stuff and surfing waves like that. You've got to be fit and got to be into it. Um, you know, psychologically, if you know, you're putting in the time and, and getting stronger and being, you know, training, it's going to translate into having that same confidence out there in the water. If you're not training and you know, that you're out there and you haven't been training, <laughs> you shouldn't, be yeah. there, you know, and, and so that might be the case for me. I may not have the time to get, um, fit on it. And maybe I go out there and I, I, I'm on the ski as a water patrol kind of thing and keeping eyes and ears. I think the experience will stay with me, but physically you yeah. gotta be, you gotta be solid a hundred percent. Um, and to be involved in it because that wave is deadly. We know it has, it's killed mm. um, surfers before it's, um, it's, it's going to kill more, I'm sure, because people are still going to keep pushing it. Uh, yeah. And, and accidents happen, unfortunately, even though we made a vast improvements with water safety, with the, you know, the work we did on airlift, um, you know, the yeah. work that, uh, Shane Dorian done with, with Billabong and developing a, a you know, an idea that, uh, it was spawned and now all of a sudden we've got these things in, that we can wear in the water that can save our lives and bring us to the surface which is pretty darn cool because we didn't always yeah. have that <laughs> yeah what is your take on that that's so it's, it's a bit of a it's a contentious issue like some people like ah oh, you know i wish it was like the old days and we didn't have it and there'd be less well, people think- this and that and then you like look at it and go well you know we probably wouldn't be pushing the limits as much as what's possible without the vest maybe maybe we would maybe we wouldn't you know evolution is it is what it is and you know people are always going to push it but what what is your take on this technology savvy era that we're living in you think it's a good thing you think it's a bad thing i i 100 think it's a good thing um anytime that you can get people um home safely you know and and oh. why not right um it's it's going to happen no matter what anyway i mean that's just human nature is to to make sure that we uh do the you know are safe at doing what we're doing um so i'm 100 percent behind it and uh, i also think that it, there's personalities that come with this that you're always going to have too that sometimes the um you know the vest kind of creates a uh, false sense and some of those personalities are you know you just either get humbled hopefully somehow by the universe you know maybe not in the lineup necessarily but it you know you just this is personalities and uh those personalities hopefully they learn you know yeah. there's the man like you know go straight and inflate as a crowd so i think that's the issue right is it getting crowded and reckless um i don't think so really to be honest i think it's actually pretty tame in the lineup and i think that there's you know limits are being pushed on the biggest days and it's because you know the the inflation vests have been a big part of that you know especially a place yeah. like jaws you know a place like hammer and yeah. well Matt, i think and i think i think if you look at guys like billy and and a lot of these guys like i mean just guys that are training a lot too you know i think that um, that's the picture like that's where you need to be right? with what you need to do yeah i think yeah, you've got like the vest and on the top of that you've got the the you know you are that fit and that confident mentally like that when that all comes together, you see what Billy does, right? There's, yeah. I mean, you can't deny it. Like I've, I've, I've seen it. I've, I mean, I train with, I train with a bunch of the guys through the winter out here, and and I see it. And you see the dedication. And you, you, when it all comes together, and it's like that flow state. And he just seems to be able to pull it off on that one day of the year at Jaws. You know, like it's you, got you really just go, oh, yeah, after. it's incredible. His personality is is so focused hyper focused and and you know that's why he's so gnarly in the lineup competing and that's whether it's sunset beach at or holly eva at two foot going on his backhand all the way up to 25 foot at, at piahi is you know his personality is is all of that right it's 100 percent involved and um you know it's he's got a goal and he's going to achieve it <laughs> right that's that uh, you can yeah. see it when you when you um, see him on his instagram or when you see him out yeah. in heat <laughs> you see it yeah very clear that's <laughs> oozes oozes out you know what i mean yeah, you know, it's like very, it's like like get in line or get out of the way <laughs> it's like yeah and why yeah. not but he's putting in why the not? time and he's doing it and he's dedicated like that why not yeah a good thing I mean, and it's not like it's been easy too he's had some pretty gnarly injuries you know and so he's he's worked his way back to to get there too which is which is pretty cool so let's talk about towards the end here let's talk about um you stepped in to do the commissioner's job um when the WSL took over, which was 2014, would I be correct in saying that around that 2014, yep. 15 zone? Yeah. And then you sort of stepped away at that stage. You, you sort of 
that you know that was a self you sort of self quarantine yourself right <laughs> because you <laughs> you you had to step away from potentially or no not potentially like not being in the contest you know what I mean like you took yourself away yeah. from that to help yeah, us did. you know to help yeah. help everyone else to try and to to push WSL and make the events better and to create that tour and and all that and um why 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 did you take that why why was that i mean i know why but like you know you, you could have still been surfing the events and and this and that like what was it that made you go you know what i need to i need to do this um and not actually try and be in the events um i i mean i felt like with what gary had built right it was to a certain point is what he had envisioned he was wanting it to get international he wanted to have international players he wanted to you know kind of create a feeder system where you could have um youngsters come into it and i felt the same way um i didn't always see eye to eye with gary on certain things you know i felt like certain things needed to be changed all right so um i yeah. felt like we could be more professional in certain aspects that you know he didn't deem as as important as say i did um and it was just like a way to work with him and take, you know, especially some financial backing by the fact that the WSL wanted to be involved in it. You think that they're going to have, um, you know, it's going to be cool. There's going to be a great broadcast that's going to come with it. And um, it was something that was very needed. And um, they asked me to be participate in it. And I was like, you know what, I, I would love to build and help build it more further, expand what Gary was able to establish, you know, start out on and, and work together with Gary to do it. Um, he had great relationships all over the world, so he was able to easily talk to everybody and communicate everything really nicely and get everything that we needed in place. So that was killer. And then, uh, you know, I was I liked rules and regulations. I don't know really why, but I did. And I wanted to see a rule book written, you know, and like Gary wasn't always like eh, too many rules. They might be, you know, it's too many rules, you know, and he um, and I you know work together to develop what we have as somewhat a rule book now as far as competitive big wave surfing is involved in the wsl elsewhere and that was something that i worked on with everyone in the wsl along with gary and built that out and there was surfer contracts right which is a whole another can of worms that you could get into like that was something where you know the surfers wanted to be, have a piece of the action and well deserved and important um, i was coming from that world so trying to bridge that gap in between an association and what the athletes feel like they deserve and that was a, always a pretty contentious issue and that was something that was very hard work um you know there was representation on both sides and you do that thing and it's learning experience it's pretty cool um and I'd like to think that a lot of people learned a few things throughout. I mean, you see yourself from where you're at now with a big wave surfing union and developing that and trying to work it and help out that the surfers are. And then the competitors are trying to do, I mean, the um, association is trying to do the same thing, you know, and trying to make something that's going to be coexisted and financially stable, right? Which uh, is still in the works, I guess. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I you know, I think you're the perfect guy. Right? I look at, you, you know, you started if you look back at the timeline, you grew up in your dad's surf shop. You know, you've you've fixed things, you've shaped, you've you've worked in retail from from everything. You were my boss at Quicksilver for a little while, right? So oh, you, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that era. You forgot about that, right? <laughs> when you had to stop. You ever um, think I was a boss? Really? <laughs> well, not really. Was but <laughs> that was a boss move. <laughs> <laughs> right? Did uh, I, well, yeah. I, I got gotcha. you. Um, but it was done really, really classy, right? <laughs> it was, yeah. Just before I was about to jump on a plane to Peru, it was awesome. Um, so we, um, so then anyway, Sorry. no. So, so you, you, you've been an athlete. You've worked in the industry, like you've worked like marketing and and all that stuff. So you manage that. You you do, and then you've done the the WSL stuff with that, and you've been the athlete. Like, where 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 is where does Big Wave stand? Like. You, I, you know, for me, like you're one of the most guys I respect. And I, I, I think a lot of people do, and I think that, you know, like, um, and it's got nothing to do with WSL dropping the tour or vice versa. Like we're in, we're in strange times, we're in strange worlds. I mean, I, I think that big wave surfing is still the best is yet to come. I truly believe that. I truly believe awesome things are coming and they're going to come. And I, and I know that it's valuable. I know that it can be there can be some good money and stability. For the surfers um whether it's events or not events uh, who knows but um and we've got some phenomenal athletes like i mean you, and you've seen them you know you've had to put kids in wild cards put them out so you, you you've seen it all coming up and i just 
like the state of big wave surfing right now, like with guys like Kai and, and Chumbo and, and Twiggy still doing his stuff at 40 something. And you, you know, these young kids, Russell Bjerke, you know, there's such amazing talent. Like what, what, where do you see the future of big wave surfing moving forward in the next few years? I think that it will see, I mean, I've said this before, but, um, there'll be advances in equipment. It'll be stuff that'll um, be kind of full circle stuff. But it'll be something that's been used and developed and then made better. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that equipment yeah. wise, I, you know, and Kyle Lenny's already at the forefront of that. A lot of the guys in, in Maui are, you know, Ian with the board he rode the other day with that, you know, or not the other day, but uh, you know, Chris the, Christensen the right? calling, yeah, the, the hog, um, which is a high Oh yeah. I mean, that's that kind of stuff I think is going to come. Um, you know, there's always going to be that in surfing. And I think that's something that will refine, uh, you know, shorter boards like, you know, Albie and, and Kai are doing, they're writing really short boards. There's big still, and, um, they surf them really well. And those are, you know, that's pushing the limits, right. And, uh, Kai's doing it with, you know, equipment across the board. Not only is it in foiling and doing all of that, it's on tow boards. It's on, yep. um, you know, wind surf boards. I mean, so he's, he's at the, uh, literally at the pinnacle, in my opinion, of just doing it all and trying stuff out hydrodynamically. He's at the way up mm. there. And, um, it's kind of cool because that's kind of what Maui has been known as innovation. And that's where the strap crew came from. It's just because you, you know, you, by force of where you live, you have to figure out ways to, to have fun. And those guys have figured it out. Uh, yeah. and then, but then we just take it from them and use it in our own ways. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, I think that's one of the things that's going to be kind of cool to see, um, you know, competition wise, I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see, I think that, um, you know, there's the Red Bull big wave awards, right. Which is an event that has been going on forever. I think that'll always be around. Matter of fact, they just named it. I think it's, that, that was, uh, um, it's going to be on, it's going to be an online, it's going to be an online, yeah. Yeah, online deal this year. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, yeah, we're not going to go party basically what it means, but I mean, they're still going to give away yeah. checks and, and that's, that's how, um, yeah, usually that's what the big wave awards are is yeah, just go party, yeah. give away some, you know, and give away some money. That are, yeah. <laughs> so that's cool. I think that, uh, um, that event is, is really what a big wave event is kind of about, right? I mean, you can have it, everybody's involved for the most part, you know, you're surfing somewhere and you're training somewhere and your wave can be involved. Right. And that's kind of cool. Yeah. I think that's one part of, uh, that's a major part of that event and why it's so, so badass is because you know one place could not have waves you don't have an event but this one's pretty much always taking place some winners are better than others but um yeah that's one that's that's going to be something i think will be around forever um but i love the one day competitions i think that that's something that people are drawn to this like you know the year-long stuff you know you see images but you're going to see the images anyway it's like it's like the climax is really is at the end when someone wins a check but you know, in a day when you can run an event, there's somebody who seizes the day. That's always something really cool. And I think you've experienced that when you were able to seize your win uh, in Nazare, a place that's just amazing. Um, you know, that those are that kind of event is different than any other event. And so those, yeah. I think, um, if we don't have a lot of those right now. We have just the, the Nazare event, which was kind of cool, change of pace for it. Um, and then, you know, the Payahi event is just amazing. You know, those are, yeah. those are insane events. So uh, I hope that Mavericks gets one back again. I think we, I, I think we'll see Waimea once again at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, I would, I would love to see it actually yeah. all, all three of those events at least, you know, um, and then, yeah. you know, the other big waves around the world. I mean, uh, from what I understand, Pico Alto, which is, you know, in Peru has been kind of, it's changed. The landscape's changed there. And they're saying that the wave isn't as, as doesn't break as often as it used to. So always being aware of that stuff too. And like trying to protect our oceans in, in any way we can yeah. is something that's important. Why I got on that tangent, but that was something that yeah. um, I know and thinking about going forward, um, just giving back in some way is, is yeah. super important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, I think funnily enough, talking about, you know, we all know things go full circle. I, I think that, I think the toe surfing is going to make a resurgence. Um, I think that it's neat in a way it's needed because I feel like when you were a toe surfer, you had a partner and you guys worked on saving each other. That was your lifeline. And you guys had to work how to drive the ski. You had to know how to go into the pit. You needed to know that it's going to be cavitating here. I'm going to get cleaned up or how much time do I have? How much white water can I hit? 
And I think that's been lost in this newer generation uh, because there has been not much toe surfing. You have specialized um, safety guys, and thank you to those guys, you know, Skull Base, the, the Walshers and Colomona and Frank, and I mean, everyone around the world that does that. But I feel like the surfers themselves that didn't grow up potentially towing a lot um, have lost that, don't necessarily know how to, if they were to be put on a jet ski, Hey, um, if I get, if I fall in the pit at Mavs, can you come get me? They'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I feel like, you know, with Nazare and, and obviously what Kai's been doing too, you know, making use of towing as well. I think that you've already seen a little shift, a, a minute shift. And I think that shift may just com- just start getting more and more over the next few years. And, and I think from what I hope to see from that is people starting to learn how to drive the skis understand the safety, how to save each other and, you know, not, not only save the partners, but, you know, someone else, you know, like, like what happened with Alex at um, Nazare this year, you know, and obviously driving a jet ski. I mean, if you haven't driven a jet ski and you go to Nazare, it's the freaking scariest thing you'll ever do on a jet ski. It's next level. But um, so anyway, that's my, that's my little, um, I think that that's probably going to, you know, we're going to see that sort of shift, shift as well. Obviously we're not going to be towing waves that we're paddling, but, those days that get borderline windy and big and, you know, guys are trying to paddle, you know, I think you're going to start to see a few more guys jumping on the, on the rope. So I agree. But, um, and and then yeah. I, I'll check it out. I mean, maybe I'll grab the rope. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll whip you. I'll whip you. All right, Pete. Well, yeah. look, uh, I'm taking too much of your time already. I've got, I've got five questions for you. Quick five questions. Okay. okay. It's called five to finish. Best big wave in the world. Get the phone, Jamie. Get the phone. Get the jam. Mavericks, come on, bro. Right. Well, you Was that even ask a question? question, bro? Well, I Mavericks, knew what you were going to say. Mavericks. Yeah. Scariest, heavier, scariest, heaviest way. <laughs> yeah, same question, you. same answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think um, Yahi is scary. I mean, if I like thinking about it, like I'm going to be a little behind the scenes. I mean, I, I, Mavericks, I kind of understand it to a point. Like Jaws, mm-hmm. I haven't still yet to really get myself a sick wave out there. So I'm actually going to like, I'm at the point now where I'm like, I need a sick wave out of there at Jaws. I haven't had a gnarly one, so yeah, uh, I wouldn't mind one. But I, yeah. I, again, I gotta be, I gotta be hundred percent involved. So sorry for yeah. lengthening your my answer. But no, no, that's okay. <laughs> Three. What's 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 one big wave that you haven't surfed that you want to surf? Uh, um, one big wave I haven't surfed that I want to surf. Uh, well, I mean, uh, shoot. Um, is it slabs count? <laughs> yeah. Slabs and gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't mind trying to get a few at the right. I don't even know where that right. place yeah, is. There you go. I haven't yeah, surfed yeah. the right. Okay. I feel like, yep. man, right, that's cool. kind of one that intrigues me. Oh, yeah, and then bit. they say that's the heavy. And and they, too, and like actually, get... Ship, shippies, yeah. Shippies, yeah. And then, those are, like, um, those are waves that I have. Yeah. Okay. Um, the most underrated big wave in the world. Mavericks. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, kind of. I think, I mean, I think, yeah, Mavericks. I mean, I, for me, Mavericks is a wave that if you're thinking about a wave that's that's nasty, like what is a wave that would be nasty? It's one that holds you down. I feel like Mavs is a wave that will hold you down. And it's because of the yeah. bottom, right? The bottom's got these huge holes and ruts in it. Peahi is flat, right? I mean, for the most part, pretty flat. There's no huge underneath caves and stuff yeah. going on, right? So. Um, yeah, you get your ass handed to you, but you're going to hit the bottom. You're not going to get held down for three minutes or whatever. Like Mavericks is one of those places is scary for that reason alone. Um, it, it has big chunks of holes and ruts and I've been held in one and I know that you, there's no airlift vest that's going to even get you up when you're getting held down like that. So, um, yeah. anyway, that's why it's scary. All right. okay. and, and it's got the, big ass shark. It does. Yeah. So don't come surf it. Um, <laughs> Where, where's the next, where's the next big wave discovery? Oh, uh, well, I, I've said it, before. I think that it's up North, right. But, um, you know, anytime you get to the poles, um, I mean, obviously the storm activity is much stronger, so it feels like you would have places that are going to be gigantic waves, but the problem is that you have these really drastic tides, right? So you get these extreme tides. So it's only shortens those little windows of opportunity. Is the wind right? Is the tide right? And that makes me feel like those spots up there are just really tough to get. But I think there's a waves up, up coast that are, that are um, 
as big and as crazy, you know, that are kind of consistent, but this people don't know. Um, yeah. That's kind of my my thinking is that that region, but for the most part, the world's pretty darn small. So <laughs> yeah. it's going to be a place that just doesn't break as often. Yeah, cool. All right, buddy. Well, I'll let you get back to work. Is that five? Say hi to, say hi to Tara for me and the family. And, uh, I will. Get back thanks and, for uh, back chatting with me, Brad. Stuff. Good. Yeah, man. Thanks for jumping on. Let's All get right, some awesome. waves soon. Good. Yeah, please. I, I hopefully have an early season and you'll be popping over this way. We can get your, uh, some rust blown out of your pipes of your ski and I can, and we can go, uh, get a few more waves before I get too old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Peter Mel. Thank you. All right. Yeah.